So what I'd like to talk to you uh, about today um, is the Embed HDK um, and how we see that um, as a route through to production for all the devices uh, that you guys are going to be building or our developers are going to be building. In many ways it mirrors the work that we've done with the SDK. It is of course one step further back. Um, it's not as mature uh, as the SDK is at this point. Um, but we have a lot of the similar aspirations for, with the HDK uh, <coughs> that Amelia and Bobman have just um, talked about. So a lot of the inspiration uh, behind the HDK uh, is the change in face uh, of hardware. So it wasn't that long ago um, that actually making hardware wasn't particularly accessible. Um, it's very low cost, uh, there's lots of design tools out there nowadays. It's actually very easy for someone to uh, conceive a product or a new design and actually take that through to production. Production isn't the hard bit anymore. The part that's hard is um, getting it right the first time, or getting it right at all, no matter. Uh, writing the software that goes on it, um, ensuring the quality of the products that you're going to ship, uh, making sure that you can manufacture devices reliably. So there's a whole set of new problems that need to be solved. In many ways, that's what we're setting out to address with the HDK. Now, on the bottom right hand side of the screen, um, in many ways, that's some of the inspiration here. Um, we see hardware is almost like the new gold rush, and I think that would be um, amplified uh, by the Internet of Things. So, with everyone having sort of Bluetooth gateways in their pocket and now bits of hardware to interact with. It's very easy to conceive that you might have the next killer app that, as well as being something that runs on your phone, also has some kind of physical, real-world uh, manifestation. And it's actually easier to, to make that than ever before. So the slides that we saw earlier with the uptake of uh, you know, these uh, mobile platforms, uh, app stores, uh, just how popular that's been, well, yeah, that could be easily mirrored uh, in the hardware world. But for that to happen, we've got to mobilise uh, a whole developer community in the same way that the app developer community has been um, mobilised over the last five years or so. So in, in many ways that's the, that's the background and uh, part of the aspiration um, uh, of the HDK and what we're setting out to solve. So the concept of uh, HDK, which stands for Hardware Development Kit by the way, um, is a term that everyone seems to latch onto and understand what we're trying to, uh, trying to achieve you know, when we speak to them. But I guess SDK as an expression has been around for a long time. And we're still really trying to uh, nail down and communicate what we're, uh, what we're trying to do here. So as with everything else we're trying to do, it's, um, it's open source. Um, and it's trying to get um, developers through to production in the same way that the SDK aims to get people through to production software. We're trying to get people manufacturing things in the body. And as the HTTP is gathering pace. Um, we've literally just put out in the last week uh, the first release. Um, we're starting to worry about new things. So uh, the Siemsys DAP um, debug architecture, which we'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, Emilio just mentioned that's now a, an open source project, so anyone can take out reference implementation, which will run out of the box on various uh, devices and target various devices uh, and adapt that for their own needs. Um, also, considering reusable and composable hardware uh, sort of reference designs. So some of the early components for the HDK is how to take a, um, uh, a microcontroller from one of our partners and actually turn that into a uh, yeah, subsystem design that you can reliably manufacture. Um, I'm sure everyone in the room has made mistakes in the past, but it's actually very easy to do. Even with simple devices, you can take uh, yeah, an off-the-shelf microcontroller and you can try and put it onto a PCB, but there's always going to be some pull-up resistor that you miss or you know, some subtle thing which we wasn't focusing on. And that's the sort of thing that can really, uh, yeah, can really hurt um, design cycles. So we're really trying to produce um, reference designs that people can adopt um, and have lots of confidence that they're just going to work out of the box. So in the short term, that's about microcontrollers, but of course, in the long term, it's not just microcontrollers. We're talking about connectivity as a uh, you know, very important part of uh, the same things. So there's probably going to be HDK targets that aren't necessarily microcontrollers but they still serve to solve a you know, complex hardware problem that needs to be solved. And as we go forward, there's other issues around manufacturability. And this has really come um, from the embed developer community themselves. We saw you know, people taking this, uh, you know, this platform and making prototypes with it. And in the early days, we always assumed that people would take a, uh, a prototype, 
throw it away and start again because now they're making real product. And what we notice quite quickly is that that's not the behaviour. They get their, um, their design good enough to ship and then they want to ship it. So the question was always, what next? You know, I've got this prototype on my bench, what do I do with it now to start shipping the product? Um, it's, you know, spinning the PCB is, is relatively easy. Um, there's lots of things that we can do to help people do that. Um, we will get into other issues. So I've now got a factory churning out a thousand of these things. You know, how do I test them? How do I make sure uh, that I can get the image onto that? How do I you know, provision them with certain bits of information that each one needs? There's a whole bunch of problems that need to be solved uh, down the line, and that's the sort of thing that we're, uh, that we're considering for the HDK. So manufacturability, uh, design for manufacture, um, test frameworks, all these things that need to be in place. And of course, uh, making sure that all of these people making bits of hardware can leverage the community and the ecosystem and all the tools that we're, we're putting together. Uh, and as part of that, you know, rapidly expanding our application engineering team, so I'm sort of the, uh, pointed out that we're now three times bigger than we were this time last year, and that's possibly set to grow. Um, so it's really about helping people take that next step. So the, the first thing that I wanted to touch on um, talking about the HDK uh, is the uh, Simpsons stat, which really is the sort of core component of this. Um, and it's the first problem that we've tackled sort of head on uh, and solved. So just to give you an overview of uh, the problem, what it, what it is, if you take a regular uh, development board set up here, you have a development board connecting to a debug probe which connects off to uh, debug target, so, sorry, debug base. Uh, and you look at the chain that's going on here, so we have a core site back inside the microcontroller, which is core standard, um, which turns out to uh, an SWD connector, a serial debug connector, which is also standard, and that connects to a magic grey box, uh, which connects to your PC over USB, which is also a standard. And yet, incredibly, do you have to have one of these boxes depending on which tool you're using or which platform you've got? And there's basically massive fragmentation considering that each step of the chain is a standard. So the idea behind SIMS is that was to, to solve this problem. So that, you know, let's take a look at what the requirements are, um, you know, what's actually needed, solve it once, solve it properly, then and solve it. So now SIMS is is an open standard from ARM that is really aimed at commoditizing debug interfaces. Um, so that if you adopt this as a standard, you can be confident that what you manufacture and what you're designing will automatically inherit the whole sort of ecosystem. It will work with any of the tools that are produced. And they're thinking about removing lock-ins and lock-outs. So um, anything that supports Simpsons is down. Uh, you can be confident it's going to work with other bits of hardware if you're worried from the software point of view, or if you're worried from the hardware point of view, you can use any tool. So it really is sort of interoperability. Um, as of this Friday, our reference uh, implementation for Sims stack is now uh, open source, um, so it can be taken uh, from GitHub. As with the SDK, it's, uh, it's under the Apache 2.0 license, so yes, yeah, commercially friendly. Um, and we currently have it running on two devices, uh, so the uh, NXP uh, M0 device, as <coughs> per um, some of the recent designs, and also the Freescale part from, from the Freedom range. So these are the devices it that can be used now in products or development boards or dev kits or whatever to provide you with programmability, debugging, and reconfigurability. Um, and you can see it's, it's a fairly uh, it's a fairly minimal set of um, files and directories right now, but I'd expect that's going to be growing over time as this really gets picked up on. So that was the uh, the CMC stack project, um, and what really comes out of that is our ability to publish HDK sort of reference designs. Um, our HDK offering. So the Embed HDK is now also uh, available from the Embed website. Um, there's a link up top. Um, and this is really about creating um, packages that people can take and manufacture products with um, and being very confident that it's going to just work essentially. So we have schematics and reference designs for um, the NXP parts that we support and also for the Freescale parts. Currently it's the KL25Z, but as, um, as we bring on the other Freedom platforms, uh, that will grow over time as well. So it's, it's not just about um, schematics, it's also about the binaries that run in those microcontrollers to make sure you have that CMS app implementation. It's also about things like um, yeah, what, can you actually, what, what can you actually say about your, your platform? Yeah, am I allowed to put an embed logo on it to essentially make a promise to my end user of uh, yeah, the quality that's in, implied? And now that the, um, the first um, sort of release is out, we're, we're seeing some um, platforms from our lead partners that we've been working with, so kind of experiment with. Ideas. So one of the very first ones um, 
uh, that we saw was from the studio. Um, so they've taken the 1768 reference design and they've created uh, an Arduino form factor um, development platform, which is uh, yeah, very interesting. It leverages a whole new sort of ecosystem, the Arduino um, shield ecosystem. Um, but the point is they've gone away and manufactured that um, kind of without really having to rely on us. But they can manufacture it knowing that you know, this is going to work with embed.org, it's going to work with all of the offline tools you can run it from GDB or any of the other sort of industry tools that are available. So in some ways the HDK has made them a promise about if they manufacture some hardware, what they can do with it. But in a good way. Um, embedded artists, another third party, so um, that have gone away and created a Cortex M4 platform, again adopting the HDK as their, their starting point. And they did the SDK port for the particular target that they used as well. But this is another um, another proof point that someone can uh, adopt the HDK and the SDK and start building products on this um, uh, and be confident that actually yeah, this is going to uh, solve the, the, the need um, down the line. The Ubox platform, I think, is the first um, first of the very interesting. Um, it's a step away from DevBall. So yeah, the CT Studio one and the embedded artist ones, they're kind of development platforms as we're used to seeing. Uh, the Ubox one is, in some ways, you could think of it as a development platform for cellular modems, but it's certainly not more than that. Um, it's basically an OEM module that's going to have network certification. Um, so, from an end user's point of view, who wants cellular connectivity, yeah, they can buy this platform and uh, not only know that it works and have confidence in it, but they've also got um, an out of the box SDK for it essentially. There's already the online tools to target it, there's already libraries published for it, there's already example code. So, just by uh, adopting that design, uh, they know that they can inherit a whole stack of, um, uh, of goodness. And the platform itself is going to be certified as well, so when you come to actually start shipping products on that, all the, the, the nasty approvals problems just kind of go away. And I think it's those sort of very tough problems like approvals and certifications. Um, yeah, that's one of the problems we're really going to have to tackle um, for some of the wireless technologies to, to really take off um, as much as we would hope. <coughs> and of course then, um, future platforms, we've got lots of uh, ideas about what we're going to do in the future. Um, you probably recognise some of those platforms as uh, ones where other support um, or support other parts of the family. So, so this one here um, is the, the link to that we're going to be working with uh, NXP on to, uh, to, to support. So yeah, it's a very interesting debug. But once of course it supports the CMC staff standard, it unlocks a whole, um, a whole bunch of tool saving chains and tool stories, but also unlocks a, a whole bunch of um, hardware platforms going forward. You've already seen the um, KL25Z platform from Freescan, which has been very popular. Uh, there's other ones in the family coming out. Again, yeah, the, the idea that sort of just supporting the range right out of the box and um, is going to happen um, sort of over the coming months. Then moving down here to a bit more to talk about things like um, programmable platforms. So here we have the Ubox platform, which I mentioned just a second ago, where this is more of an OEM sort of module, uh, essentially. And again, it still, it still leverages the fact that you've got this reprogrammability, reconfigurability. Uh, but you're also getting the goodness that's not necessarily engineering based, it's like certification. And of course, you know, Simon mentioned the, uh, uh, the work we've been doing and going to be doing publicly with Nordic. So again, targeting things like um, you know, these very, very low cost modules, having the tool chains that um, sort of target these and strike out some of the complexity. Um, yeah, that's going to be another thing that really drives forward the, the adoption of this. I'm not actually sure what this is, but it's kind of a cool picture. Um, <coughs> and that was kind of on purpose. So I think there's going to be um, products in the future. We can't really necessarily conceive what they are at the moment, but reconfigurability is going to be an important part of their behavior. So whether it's generically mass produced IoT devices um, that the end user has to you know, either configure or customize in some way. Um, <coughs> who knows what they are? They haven't been invented yet. But the point is, Having something like um, yeah, the embed platform there to support them means that you can get a generic product, uh, and as the end user, you can customize it to your, your own needs. I think we've we'll got to talk about that in, uh, in a couple of slides time. So, the, the fact that these things you know, are going to be built on things like the HDK and SDK, um, it's really going to unlock the creativity of the people whose hands they go. I've always said that you know, the amount of people um, that are going to be doing this development work is probably small compared to the number of users out there. But by providing mechanisms for reconfigurability, you know, people can share this configuration. So almost like it's kind of like apps, but for hardware. And I think that's a, an interesting market that um, I don't think anyone's really given that much thought to at the moment. But we'll, uh, I think we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, in terms of uh, sort of other things, um, as with all good products, it had a roadmap associated with it. Um, so at the moment, we've just released. Uh, 
uh, the HDK. So this is the first set of reference designs, the uh, Simpsons DAP implementation that I saw. So in many ways the clock starts sort of ticking now. Um, we've got lots of things sort of lined up um, in the future, and of course, you know, part of this is to, to work out what other things need to happen that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, so the standard bootloader, um, that's been a, a consistent problem for a long time, and in the same way that we sort of sat down and solved the sort of debug interface issue, we'd like to also uh, standardise on uh, bootloaders. It turns out it's quite a hard problem to, to solve, everyone's got their own, um, their own way of solving it, and they'll have their own problems and, um, and issues. So yeah, maybe there is an opportunity to take a lead here on you know, how do you bootload a device, um, you know, whether that's locally, whether it's over USB, whether it's um, over the air. Um, but there's some, there's some work to be done uh, there. From a, an interface point of view, you know, how do we start looking at power profiling? So you see that um, <coughs> being quite standard in uh, sort of some very high-end debug programs. But I think there's uh, opportunities to do this at a sort of the lower end of the scale, where you're not trying to measure down to the nearest nanowand. What you're really trying to do is get a feeling for how it changes when you go into one mm -hmm. super and go to another. Or just get a feel for the trends. So I think there's some interesting power profiling that we can do um, in the interface uh, over time. Uh, and of course, wireless HDKs. You know, I mentioned earlier that not all HDKs are necessarily going to have a um, So a lot of the purpose of the HDK is to solve difficult problems once and be able to share it uh, in a sort of very connection friendly way. So if, if we think of something like a Bluetooth low energy, for instance, you can buy a very say, less than two dollar parts. Well, that's, that's really, really great, but then you've got to go through approvals and you have to worry about antenna design and all these sorts of issues. Uh, we don't know quite what the answer is yet, but it feels there's an opportunity here to kind of understand what the problems are and solve them in a way that not everybody has to go through that, uh, yeah, that, that loop over and over again. So, you know, factor out the really hard bit and, and set that, solve that. And of course, there's a bunch of challenges that we've, you know, we've not even identified yet. Um, I guess you guys see different problems to what we see. So actually, by being able to talk to you and understand uh, you know, what issues you know, your customers ask for or what things sort of bug you, and uh, yeah, help us shape the, the roadmap of this sort of over time. In terms of other bits and pieces, um, commoditization, I guess, is one thing that we sort of aspire to. So, you know, CMC staff really is about commoditizing debug interfaces and sort of gathering people. Uh, um, so in, in the lab we've got this new recipe for um, an ultra low cost um, uh, debug brew. So it's based on the HDK interface, so the part that goes on to uh, develop the boards or the program the product. And the idea is it's either an external debugger that's so dirty if you wouldn't, you know, why, why would you do it really? Or actually if you wanted to um, you know, suck this entire thing into your own design and have essentially an onboard debugger for um, you know, j j just a couple of dollars or possibly not even more. It's not necessarily about debug, it's about the configurability and the programmability also. So there's, there's extra angles to this, it's not just about putting a code on board. And as I just mentioned, we're also experimenting with um, sort of low cost uh, radio hardware in yeah, sort of form factors that people can actually pick up and use, but in a way that there's an understanding of moving through to production. So if we start working with these things and understand what the implications are from you know, RF design or certification, solve that problem once and then make sure everyone. Best so these are a couple of the uh, sort of recipes that we're, that we're playing with at the moment. <coughs> uh, and I've alluded to this before, but the um, sort of programmable products. So I think this is a very interesting um, opportunity for Embed. Um, in the very early days, um, I think quite a few people objected to the fact that Embed was basically online. Um, it sort of broke the mold and upset a lot of people. And I think people begin now to see that there's advantages and benefits to that. So for instance, if you've got a very generic product that you can just sell out into the market as a generic thing, having the tools online for people to do customization, you know, Embed can actually be the vehicle through which you can add um, sort of value to a product, even when it's out there in the field. Uh, and that really is because we can leverage the online nature of, of Embed. Um, the instant SDK, so this is the idea where you, you make a a product that does something, uh, and that's why people buy it. But by supporting uh, the HDK and therefore the SDK and the ecosystem and all the things that go with that, um, that program, that product becomes essentially hackable. So right out of the box, you have a developer community who understand how to program that hardware. 
um, and you have the development kit and all the tools that you need to, to reconfigure that. So it might be taking product A and turning it into different behaviour. And it might also be uh, from a reconfigurable reconfigurability point of view. But there's very few people out there that would actually do that, but there might be lots of people who would take advantage of that. So in, in some ways, you, know, you can imagine having a hackable toy that does something, and then someone can create a new behaviour for it, like, you know, post the binary on Facebook or whatever, and that's like the next viral um, application for that piece of hardware. So that, that's why describing it as app, um, apps for, for hardware is, is kind of an interesting sort of analogy. And that leads on to uh, sort of configurable builds. So this is where the, I say, the hardware applications, um, or apps for, for hardware, if you think of it in that way, that's really what it's about. And as I said before, the fact that there's so many more users out there than people hacking it, um, is, is kind of expected. So you only need one bright spark to come up with a, the next killer app for your, whatever it is, toy, and you know, the whole thing is using it. Now, there's other interesting things like production lines. So this goes back to a lot of what we were talking about earlier from yeah, how to get people through to um, uh, production. So if we have configurable builds where uh, production time you can actually request um, you know, a pre-configured build for a particular unit that's coming off of your production line, this may not necessarily be about programming all of them with the same image. It might be uh, a different image for each thing that rattles off the production line. Maybe it's customised for you know, um, whoever's purchased that. So in the same way, I think when you buy a Kindle and plug it in for the first time, it kind of knows who you are. Um, it, it's about how do you how do you provide that kind of um, yeah, that kind of user experience, but for, for everyone, because not everyone has the infrastructure to go and build you know, Kindle from, from the ground up. But you're really using some of the infrastructure we've got, we can certainly provide that. And I think that comes back to uh, when we were talking about security. And so that might also be an option for you know, how you provision uh, security keys on the production line. So you know, the security is actually injected at the very, very last minute, and maybe it correlates with um, you know, some, other, uh, yeah, some other part of the process. So the people manufacturing and programming and doing the test aren't necessarily the people that are worrying about how something is provisioned or how security is injected. So uh, yeah, I think the, the online nature of the tools can, um, yeah, might really be able to play a part there. So that's all I've really got to, to say on the subject of the HDK um, and where we're taking it. Um, I guess we have a couple of minutes spare if there are a few questions. Do you know if there's any plans to support yeah. price? No. Um, so no, that's no. I don't know whether there is plans. Um, I'll certainly find out. But hopefully, I'll be able to get the answer. And has the ITM problem been fixed? I think uh, the additional tracing in investigators right now, uh, but there are no clear timelines for the plans here. Okay, does anyone have any not really complicated technical questions? <laughs> 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 Um, I don't know whether it's superseded, I guess both are going to be available. I think the difference is what's available to connect is a reference implementation that you would then have to go and port to whatever device you want to run it on. The aspiration behind the open source project that we have published is that right out of the box there is a binary that will run on these particular parts, so on these particular part targets, and over time that will grow. So as developers port to other, um, yeah, other manufacturers or other targets, yeah, that, that, that will expand. So, so I, think, I think the objectives are, are slightly different. It, it, it's also um, the Ryan Silver is a, is a reference of the protocol. I know. And then the, this project that uh, Chris is talking yeah, about, it goes quite a lot beyond that. So we worry about you know, serial port emulation, we worry about mass storage device, we worry about bootloading. So how do you do firmware upgrade in the future and all that sort of stuff? So this is more like a product. Yeah, I mean, it just happens to be a collaborative product that we want to make for it. I realize that. Yeah. So I'm kind of just thinking I have enough of this project. We will keep a reference. Yes, exactly. We'll keep a reference. You know, the the the, the SimSys that um, uh, project and, this, uh, and as a specification um, is something that we will make available and we will make available the sort of the C reference for that. So you can adopt it in whatever. You want to adopt it. Yeah. 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 Y
and then this will be an so this is the project here. So they're, they're both, they both coexist. I mean, effectively, we inherit that and then turn it into a product. Uh, but other people will want to turn it into a product for other reasons. Yes, so, the, so I think the implementation we have is probably far more closely aligned with what people actually need to be injected on their production line rather than here's a reference of some architecture that's been. Okay. Yeah. So I was wondering if uh, the MVP interface is uh, chip that's, say, on the other side of the board, uh, can, can anyone share some details about that? Because I'm trying to use uh, the embed uh, board itself to, to merge into my design. And since it is an open source hardware platform, I, and that information about that chip itself is not available on any of the uh, schematics, actually. So, yeah, so, so the original embed module that has the magic chip, as we call it, on the underside, in many ways, that was, a, that was an experiment. Um, and it was something that we had to create a long time ago just to bootstrap, bootstrap the whole project. The Embed HDK really plans to be kind of the next incarnation of that. So rather than using this magic chip that there's no source code references for and no schematics, what we now have is an, uh, an implementation It's slightly different. It's using a much, much cheaper part, you'll be glad to know. And there's schematics for it, there's the binary, and there's the source code for it. So from, from here on, everything is very, very much open. But for lots of reasons, we're not going to open source what went before. Partly because it doesn't make sense, and it, you know, it was just an experiment. That, that's, that's, the, that's the learning we have to go to to get through, get to where we are now. So essentially, whatever uh, HDK is there online, like um, the embed.org, can easily just be implemented and uh, using the code, you can just do as everything's uh, the same thing that the embed uh, hardware is doing right now. Yeah, so, so for instance, this, um, this platform here from Seed Studio, um, yeah, it's a dev board, which is essentially, um, in many ways, just a clone of the existing embed. There's a few bits of functionality you don't get with the HDK, you don't get the local file system. Uh, for various reasons, there's no more flash. flash. Um, but the, the embed tools will, will target that directly and it's exactly embed compatible. Uh, even the Ethernet was probably a problem on the on the HDK that was given outside. The, the four Ethernet pins that you have on the LPC176 side, that also was probably not the you know, when I was implementing it up to that, like around two to three weeks old information right now. But uh, I, I wasn't able to implement even the Ethernet part of the board. Okay. So, so the, the new HDK um, includes things like you know, the Ethernet 5, all the circuitry we need around that. But rather than bringing it out to four pins, it actually shows you how to connect it to an RJ45 connector with the passive service. <coughs> so it really is a recipe to build bits of hardware that you can be sure are just going to work out the box. Uh, and it's also the, the same HDK that um, you brought to build their platform on as well. So yeah, it really is a recipe to do um, to do boards that just just work with the tools in the community. Yep. Can you go back to the slide where you had the uh, and they hooked up to the UI? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, not that. There's another one where you show. Yeah. Um, this board here. Is that the development board that that the embed thing sticks sits on top? I don't know. This was just a, an abstract example of showing a generic dev board connected to a debug uh, <coughs> Because I was wondering if the, the current board you have now, when I'm using the MSYS data, why could we? I don't hook up a new one to it. So are you saying with the new HDK you have to do that? So, so essentially, the, uh, the HDK inc includes the functionality of the unit. So by putting that tiny little two dollar chip or whatever it's on the board, yeah. you essentially get all the functionality of the unit plus drag and drop programming plus the okay. you know, So you're just using this as an illustration. I was just, just trying oh, to show why, why I think it was broken before yeah. since yeah. the stack was in. These are the bad old days. It's basically at the background there should be like dark clouds and stuff. <laughs> 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 yep. Okay, yeah, so it's uh, time to move on. This next up is... Ben.